We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night. Ember hot and icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end... What will I become? Senwa Saga. Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. Hey everybody, welcome to the Single Tracks Podcast. My name is Jeff, and today my guest is Tom Prohaska. Tom is a co-founder and director at Gravity Logic, which is a bike park design and development company based in Whistler, British Columbia. He served as the manager of Whistler Bike Park from 2001 to 2007 and designed the iconic Top of the World Trail, which opened in 2011. Since then, he's worked on bike parks all over the world, from the Western U.S. to Europe and South America. Thanks for joining me, Tom. Yeah, likewise. Um, Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Well, tell us, how did you get involved in mountain bike trail building? Well, when I became the manager at uh, Whistler Bike Park in 2001, that was pretty much my introduction to trail building. Before that, I was, um, you know, I was an avid mountain biker since 1981. And, uh, Hmm. and I, you know, my, my skill to the bike park was management because I managed, uh, I managed this program for the ski school. So, uh, and my enthusiasm for mountain biking, uh, got me the job. And after that, I, you know, I, I had great mentors like uh, Rob Coquette, my partner, and Dave Kelly, who's he's he's the guru. He's the guru. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you started uh, at the bike park in 2001. What was the park like then when it was kind of newer and and not as well known as it is today? Uh, yeah, you you know it was uh, it was pretty grassroots uh, for most part. We you know, we were doing 26,000 or 12,000, I think, 12,000 visits or something like that when I started. And, uh, you know, most of the trails were uh, single tracks, although mm-hmm. Beeline was built already, which was the first excavator trail. And then okay. they started building A-Line in 2000. And, you know, that was pretty revolutionary, but uh, it, mm-hmm. it was pretty raw at the time you know you had joyride and and uh you know pretty pretty sort of burly trails mm-hmm. so it was it was grassroots yeah yeah well, when you say grassroots i mean was was there like a lot of money to build trails then or was this just like were people volunteering to build the trails or yeah what was it like sort of in those days not that grassroots <laughs> it, there was investment <laughs> You know, we, we laugh about this a lot because, it, you know, when Rob McSkimming, who's our boss, he was, uh, you know, he was a VP of business development, developing mm-hmm. new businesses for the mountain and a super avid mountain biker, by the way. And um, his idea was to take over. There was a bike park there before that was privately run by Eric White, but mm. Eric didn't have the investment, so so Rob said, "Look, you know, we're we'll take take it over here, and uh, we'll put we'll put some money into it." And and we always laugh about about the upper management saying, "Okay, Rob, you know, here's rope. We're going to give you this much rope to hang yourself with, and when you fail <laughs> at this dumb idea, we're you know we're going to fire your ass. How's that?" And Rob goes, "Okay, that's a good deal," <laughs> and uh, you know. That's in a nutshell, right? So, yeah, you know, there was investment, but it was pretty rudimentary. The way it worked, which is kind of interesting, is it was a business unit and it had a budget. And there was a bottom line. Okay. And if you meet that bottom line, you're good to carry on. Mm-hmm. So but what happened was we were not only meeting that bottom line, we we're exceeding that bottom line. So we were taking that... Mm money that we exceeded the bottom line with and put it back in the bike park. Well, hmm. you know, the bean counters didn't catch on to that for many, many years. And uh, so we were able <laughs> to pump a lot of money into the bike park in the 
early days, although in the very early days, there wasn't a lot. You know, we used to go raid the boneyard for for materials to build things with mm -hmm. and, you know, things like that. So, like I said, there was, there was commitment, but it was a kind of a sort of bit of a hesitation on the, on the management. But by about 2003, 2004, 2005, it was pretty evident that this thing was working. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think I read that uh, by the time you left as the manager in 2007, the bike park was seeing over a hundred thousand visits in a season. Was it, was it pretty like gradual, like every season you were seeing more people or was there, was there like one thing that kind of like really lit the fire and, and got people there? Yeah. I'd say continuous investment was, was a key, but how mm -hmm. we, we invested was, uh, was sort of the, you know, cherry on the top. We built a line first, first mm -hmm. jump line built ever. And then mm -hmm. we went with, um, you know, easy does it. We, the our guide said, because guiding was taken off as well. And, uh, the guide said, we need a green trail mm -hmm. and we're going, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, what do you, what do you mean you need a gr green trail? Isn't this like easy enough over here? And they go, no, no, we need a real green trail. And that was, you know, that was really important because most of us guys that were working in the bike park were, you know, fairly good bike riders and didn't really care about building a green mm -hmm. trail. But that, that was a key, you know, to to uh, success with the guiding, which is a huge financial component of a bike park operation. Mm. And then, you know, we saw that we were getting a lot of people on A-line that did not that were over their head, you know, didn't really belong there. So mm -hmm. we go, we need, we need sort of a smaller A line. So we build crank it up and, you know, next thing crank it up was seeing more as many or more riders than A line. And, uh, <laughs> you know, then dirt merchant, which was an iconic jump line, which <laughs> by the way, actually was a bit of a mistake because <laughs> we were building, we were building, uh, uh, easy does it and it was all laid out with flagging mm -hmm. and uh i don't know dave was on days off or something like that anyway the the trail crew missed the flagging missed the whole corner hmm. and headed straight down the mountain and then we you know we came back we looked at it go yeah well okay that's done so i guess let's just build a jump line now <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah wow anyways uh but that's you know it's an iconic trail in the bike park and i think that what really kind of took it over the top was uh garbanzo hmm. okay yeah that's that's like a whole other area of the bike park right that's a like whole new bike park really yeah you know and that was super kind of super revolutionary and th this is where you know the investment came in um you know, the way we were doing our accounting came in really handy because <laughs> it took a lot of money and, uh, you know, to go ask for, uh, for money for management is, you know, it's not that easy, mm -hmm. but we were, we were just basically making a lot of money and, and our budgets were kind of, you know, pretty conservative operation budgets and anything over top, we were just putting back into the bike park. So, yeah, you know, Hey, if it was today, I don't know if we if we'd get that. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, today Whistler is is recognized as the best bike park in the world, and it sounds like part of that is is kind of a happy accident. I mean, you got lucky in terms of resources and commitment to like building the park out over many years. What do you think makes Whistler such a special place? Yeah, it's, it, it is, you know, it, it is a happy accident what happened at, at Whistler. But thanks to guys like Dave Kelly that understood, you know, the fact that if you go to excavate a trail, you need to do it at a certain grade. You know, who would have mm -hmm. thought of that, right? <laughs> like that's science, you know, that's science. Yeah. And, uh, and it, because if we screwed up, I, if we screwed up the grades on A-Line, Dirt Merchant, Crank It Up, even Easy Does It, 
you know, it just would not be the same, right? It would, it would be a failure. Right. And uh, so, you know, that, that was a um, really good thing that Dave, Dave really, you know, had his shit together in that way. <laughs> and um, also, you know, we're blessed with, uh, with incredible terrain. Mm. Like the, the bottom part of the mountain where uh, on Fitzsimmons chair, where most of the bike park is, is pretty flat train. Like, mm-hmm. like nobody skis there. Right. Only only beginner lessons go down there, you know. And you and you think, well, how can you have a good bike park and when it's that flat? Mm-hmm. The grades are so good that you know you can build trails without sort of too much too much uh, battle with with you know steep grades. Mm-hmm. And those trails are really good, like A line, dirt merchant, crank it up for instance, yeah. right? And then to, you know, to make it spicy, you go up to Garbanzo. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that terrain's a totally different up there. You know, there's cliffs, rocks, lots of slick rock. So, yeah, we're blessed with with really good environment. Mm. Yeah. Was it difficult to get, like, approvals there? Is this Or is this somewhere where you, you kind of have free reign over all the terrain sort of surrounding the resort? No, we, we, we went through approvals. It was pretty easy in the, in the old days. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, we work with a, our environmental manager who's not a mountain biker, mm. but a really, really good guy, you know, and understands the environment and really was committed to work with us. Mm-hmm. So he, he's a guy that taught us about drainage and things like that. In the, mm-hmm. the early, early days, a line didn't have a lot of drainage, for instance, and uh, hmm. every spring would be, you know, putting down sheets of plywood over muddy areas. And then <laughs> Arthur came along, you know, our environmental guys says, "You guys need to clean this up," and that's how you do it. Hmm. And so in came pipes, and you know, so we learned as we went along. But uh, nowadays, you know, when when Creekside was developed, there's a there was a lot more involvement from you know you got first nations involved Mm -hmm. there was more environmental involvement from uh from the province but everything's still you know pretty pretty easy i would Hmm. yeah we 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 do a lot of work in the states you know and deal with the forest service or europe where you work you know dealing with austria germany italy you know the with their forest service people and Mm -hmm. it it can be tough. Yeah. Yeah. Well then tell us sort of segue us into how gravity logic got its start. Um, It sounds like a lot of you were involved with the Whistler bike park and building trails there. How did, how did gravity logic, the trail building trail development company get its start? (laughs) We're sitting in a bar having a beer (laughs) after work. And what happened in those early days was, you know, we'd get a lot of visitors you know, from all over the world. And me being the mm-hmm. manager, I got sent out to guide them around the park, which, you know, I didn't mind. It was fun. Hmm. But, yeah. you know, then I had I had paperwork and I'd be, I'd be in the office till 8, 9 at night finishing up my paperwork. And we're, we're laughing, you know, we're going, hey, maybe we should just start a co- consulting company Mm -hmm. and uh that way that company can take care of all this stuff and maybe one day we'll be we'll be building bike parks around the world let's have another beer Mm -hmm. that's basically (laughs) that's how it started and uh so rob mcskimming our boss uh brought it up with uh higher management and they go why would you want to, you know, teach our competition how to how to build bike parks so they can mm. compete with us? Where I said, hey, if we don't have any other resorts building bike park bike parks and quality bike parks, we're not going to grow mm-hmm. because the sport will not grow. Mm. They kind of bought into it, you know, because <laughs> the winter business is super competitive, right? But the summer business is totally different, right? You know, Mm -hmm. it's more symbiotic relationship between bike parks rather than competitive. And uh, so we started, this is till 2005, we started Gravity Logic as another business unit of Whistler Blackcomb. Okay. 
and then 2007 when Fortress Investments bought IntraWest, which means they bought Western Blackcomb as well. They went over the operation with a fine-tooth comb and mm-hmm. and said, "Hey, this this company, Gravity Logic, you know, get rid of it because too much, too much uh, risk attached and not enough profit." So, mm. you know, our boss Rob came to us and said, "Boys, we're we're done. We were, and Dave, Rob, myself, and then another fellow, Jeremy Roche." We were kind of the principal guys that were involved in Gravity Logic within Worcester Black Hole. Mm-hmm. And so Rob said, we're done. What do you guys want to do? I said, hey, I'll buy the company. He said, maybe you should ask your wife first. <laughs> I said, no, she'll, she'll be okay with it. And uh, Dave <laughs> said, yeah, I'm with you. And then Rob Coquette came in, and the three of us basically bought the company off of Worcester Black Hole. They gave us a mm. smoking deal in terms, and... Here we are. Yeah. Well, and then I imagine you went on to do projects for Whistler now as sort of their contractor. And one of the one of the projects you're credited with is uh, the Top of the World Trail. Tell us a little bit about that trail, how it came together, and what makes it different from the other trails in the bike park. So it wasn't my idea. It was Rob McSkimming's idea. He He's the idea guy. Hmm. And... Um, he said, I want a, you know, a trail off the top, top of the mountain. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you guys design it and you guys build it. And we said, okay, sounds good. So I actually designed it with my, with my son. Hmm. And then, um, he was a pro rider at the time. And, uh, and, uh, then when we started building it, I, you know, I, I got called away from Whistler. So he, he was actually the project manager on the, on the project because he, hmm. he understood the, you know, the design of the trail. Mm-hmm. So um, what, what makes it different is I, I would say it's more the sort of the environment and the vistas rather than just the, the trail itself, because, mm. you know, it's basically a uh, single track. We tried for a blue, but the top is, you know, kind of dark blue, I would say almost black. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's just super rocky up there. I, I think with dynamite, we could make it blue. <laughs> In any case, uh, it's just, you know, it's just a single track that, you know, has got the, has got this incredible views and, and um, mm-hmm. environment that just does not, exist in the in the lower park which is all in the in the trees Mm -hmm. most of this trail is actually i would say two-thirds of the trail are are in the alpine yeah no trees whatsoever and then it drops into you know big forest and uh like old growth forest and uh, just the whole experience is uh is pretty amazing and now with you know with the development of uh creekside when you get to the end of top of the world, you can either enter into the bike park at sort of the bottom of the garbanzo zone Mm -hmm. and uh, carry on down to the village, or you can peel off and go down to Creekside uh, and, you know, variety of trails going, going down there. So it's, it's 5,000 vertical uh, feet of descent, you know? And uh, yeah, so I think that's what makes it special. It's not that it's like, you know, the design of it or anything is that special. It's just a, you know, cool single track, but the mm. the vistas are just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, it is very different from the rest of the park because of the elevation and just, yeah, much more natural at the top. It sounds like maybe that wasn't necessarily by choice. That was because the terrain is just so rugged and, yeah, you're not putting in a, a jump style trail up there. It's it's definitely more natural. Yeah, it was, you know, and actually Rob, he actually wanted a bit of an uphill in it. I'm going, Rob, this is a, hmm. you know, we're a downhill <laughs> bike park. He goes, I know, but, you know, up there people are going to be taking smaller bikes and, you know, they'll want to pedal a bit. And we, at one time we did have a little, you know, little bit of a pedal in it. Nowadays, actually, that section got rerouted. But people go up there on, you know, not just on downhill bikes. It 
there's a pass that the mountain sells and it's a top of the world pass. Mm -hmm. And what it, what it allows you to do is you get one lap per day and you can go up there. So what, so what mm -hmm. guys are doing is they go up there on their, you know, enduro bikes that they ride all the valley trails on and mm -hmm. just go for that big, massive lap, uh, lap up there on enduro bikes. So it's not really, yeah, it's not really like, it's not a jump line. It's, it's jump line wouldn't fit up there. Put it that way. Right. It's, you know, yeah. it's more, yeah, much sure. more about the environment and the feel of, you know, just being out there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So these days, it seems like there are a lot of projects that use the term bike park. And I'm thinking everything from like small local pump tracks and skills parks to like full on lift serve terrain. I'm curious, since you're one of the, the early uh, bike park builders, like what's what's your definition for the term bike park? And, and do you think it's changed over time? Yeah, I would say it's changed because... Um Anywhere where there is a concerted effort and to concentrate trails and a trail network in a zone, you can call that bike park. Mm -hmm. Whether you pedal it, mm -hmm. shuttle it, lift access, whatever, it's a bike park, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. you know, whereas in the old days, you know, it used to be, oh, there's a trail over on that mountain. Oh, there's a trail over on that mountain, you know? eventually all that all that got concentrated if you look at the north shore where i started riding you know there was like two or three hiking trails when we started in the early 80s uh -huh. and we chundered ourselves down those things and now it's it's a bike park you know it's hmm. definitely you could call it a bike park but it doesn't have a lift and people pedal it yeah yeah it's almost right it suggests suggests that it's it's purpose built that it's a park made yeah. for riding bikes and whether that's trails or pump track or or whatever it's it's made for biking absolutely yeah yeah so bike parks though have have traditionally been located at ski resorts uh, which seems like a good way to maximize the return on investment and keep the resorts busy year round but now we're seeing these bike only resorts and some of them even have fixed lift service like you're mentioning are operators able to get a decent return on investment on a bike only ground up build these days? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's not an easy one. Um, you should, uh, you should ask the guys from Highland, you know, Highland is a, is a bike only hmm, uh, yeah. operation. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, they get hit by winter, so they got to shut down. I don't n know of uh, another uh, operation that is lift assisted that is just bikes. Yeah, the only one that comes to mind for me is the Spider Mountain in Texas. Oh, um, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it seems yeah, like a newish mountain. thing, and I guess they don't they don't have snow there, so maybe that helps. I think they may have just got some. I went up the lift with some guys from Texas, <laughs> <laughs> and they said they just oh, got man. snow. But in, in any case, um, it it all comes down to volume, right? So if you mm -hmm. can, um, if you can get, you know, like that 80, 70, 80, 100,000 visits in your bike park, you can be profitable. Mm. You know, under that, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not that easy, put it that way. And if it's a shuttle mm -hmm. operation, it's even less easy. And then if you're going to invest, uh, we've done, you know, we've done studies on this for clients. If you're going to go buy a lift and spend, you know, whatever, three, four, five million on a lift, and then mm -hmm. you're, you know, your return on investment, it's, you're looking at 10 plus years. Wow. So, you know, that's not that easy. But if you are a ski area operate operator and you know you've got the, all the infrastructures there mm -hmm. you got the lifts you got the buildings it's uh it's definitely a de definitely a profitable venture if you do it right mm -hmm. and that's the important part yeah. you know that you design the right trails you you build the trails properly because if you don't then 
your bike park is like a bad car. You know, the thing's always broken mm-hmm. and costs you nothing about money. And pretty soon you're just going to, you know, send it into the scrapyard, right? Easy with a car, not that easy with a bike park. So, yeah, yeah there, there's a, you know, there's a, a few components to it. And, uh, and you know, one of the interesting things is in Europe, they're, you know, they're used to when they, when they have a winter operation. So the lift company owns a lift. Mm-hmm. The farmers under the lift own the land. Then someone else owns a ski school. There may be four or five ski schools. And then someone else owns a pizza place and the schnitzel place. Yeah. You know what I mean? So lift mm-hmm. companies only selling lift tickets. Hmm. Well, in a bike park situation, that's real. That's a really tough business model. What hmm. in bike park situation, 50% of your revenue comes from those lift tickets. And the other 50% comes from guiding, rental, retail, hmm. food and beverage. That's another 50%. So if you, if you don't, if you're not in charge of that, and that's not under your umbrella, you're missing out on a huge segment of your, uh, of your, Hmm. Um, income potential. Yeah. Well, are these resorts that have both summer and winter operations, are they seeing more of their revenue shift toward the summer as the winters seemingly are getting shorter or, or at least just more unpredictable? Well, yeah. For instance, you know, like GLC bar at Whistler here, that's at the bottom of the bike park, which was closed when I started at the bike park. They closed it in the summers. It now uh-huh. makes more money in the summer than it does in the winter. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, just, you know, like you can go there at 11 in the morning, have a beer and a burger, whereas who's going to be sitting there mm-hmm. at 11 in the morning on the winter? You know, they're skiing, right? Right. But so, so, you know, that part, yes. But the other part, I mean, this place does 2 million skier visits. And, you know, 200,000 biker visits. So it is profitable, oh, wow. but not nearly as profitable as a as winter operation. Yeah. Is, it, is the winter season shorter than the summer? Well, you're, you've got, uh, you're from, uh, let's just, you know, let's just call it December till uh, it's open until April, May. Mm-hmm. You know, so you're like six months. It's about the same. Well, actually, biking is a little bit less. Okay. I think biking is May till uh, middle of October. But it's just the volume. You know, it's just it's just the volume of visits. Yeah. You know, and uh, hmm. so the bike park does make good money because your your operating expenses are way way lower than in the winter. No snowmaking, hmm. no no grooming. Right. You know, you, you your uh, trail crew, your basically is fraction of what the amount of people you're employing in the winter. Mm-hmm. So per visit, I think it's more more uh, profitable, but by volume, no. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that kind of leads me to my next question about. Uh, the work that needs to be done in keeping the bike trails running during the season. It sounds like it's not super labor intensive, but you still, you still have to do stuff, right? You can't just like open the park and, and not touch it for the whole summer. Right. So what's, what's kind of involved in keeping the trails in good shape? Commitment. <laughs> That's what it is. A lot of, a lot of places, you know, they go, Oh, well, we spent all this money on the trails. Now, now we're going to not spend any money on, a, you know, on maintenance, mm-hmm. we're just going to save money. We're just going to open the trails and and take in the cash. Well, you know, sooner or later, it's kind of back to the back to your car. You know, if you don't change the oil and look after it, pretty soon, it's just going to cost you a lot more money mm-hmm. than it would if you if you did those maintenance things. So, in our planning, basically, we say that you need ten percent of your of your capital investment as your maintenance budget. Okay. You know, it's a pretty general number that works for maybe a bigger resort. Some of the smaller ones might not be as much, but, but 
you know, it's a good sort of a benchmark. Mm-hmm. And the commitment has to come from, you know, from the management where they go, yeah, we know we spent all this money to build the trails, but we understand that we now need to keep spending money to mm-hmm. maintain these trails. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, the, with us, we work for, we work for clients and, you know, if we build them a bad car, they'll never ask us to come by, back mm-hmm. again. So we might as well just shut the door. So the key is that the trails that we design and build for our clients are the least maintenance type of trails mm-hmm. yeah. possible, you know? So, right. you know, in the end, if you can, you know, if you can ride a trail uh, all season and spend a total of, you know, few days fixing it, mm-hmm. doing some spot maintenance, you're good. If if you have a zone where, you know, you just fix the brake bumps, but two days later, they're back the same, mm-hmm. it's, it's bad news because, first of all, it costs you money, and it's very demoralizing to the trail crew. Yeah. Very demoralizing when they're doing nothing but fixing brake bumps, and they come back next day and they're the same that they were the b- day before. Mm. It's just, it's, and that comes from design. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. D- does the trail design ever work exactly as you planned it on paper or, or do you learn those things? Like, do you run it a little bit and then you say, Oh, we're getting brake bumps here. We need to adjust it. Oh, if you get in brake bumps, you're, in, you're in, uh, you're in deep trouble because that means, uh, trail realignment, which means you can't just say, Okay, we're going to realign this hundred meters. You got to go back up, mm-hmm. you know, five hundred meters and start your realignment there, mm-hmm. and then, yeah. you know, another five hundred meters lower to finish the realignment. Right? Mm-hmm. You could have, you know, kind of little spot things like, oh, we we want to push the corner out a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But what we have learned in our, you know, over the years in designing all these all these trails, and it's the excavator trails that are most, most sort of important is if you get the design just right, mm-hmm. your build, um, you know, our crews are so good now that they know exactly how to read our flagging, our design. Mm-hmm. You get it just right. You do not go back. You do not go back. Mm. Like we, we built a bike park in, uh, in Germany called Green Hill two or three years ago. Mm-hmm. They, they opened up, and my main guy over there, Jerry Luchan, he's from Czech Republic, we designed it together, and then he was in charge of the build. I came in, you know, kind of a couple times, and he didn't even ride a bike the whole time. And the guys that were huh. building it with him, they're going, what do you mean you don't have a bike? How are you going <laughs> to test the jump? He goes, I look at the jump, and I know if it's going to be good or not. I don't wow. need to ride it. I'm just <laughs> wasting time if I'm riding. And and everything worked perfect, right? So hmm. that's kind of how you got to be. Um, with single tracks, it's a little bit different. You know, they're like um, less science. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, so you might you might build a single track and then then guys decide, oh, hey, this sneaky line over here is, is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of bike parks, they don't like that, you know, braiding and so on. But I look at it, you go, hey, maybe that line's a little better than what I thought it was, you know? Right. And let's just either include it, or if it's if it's a problem, then you close it, mm-hmm. or you close my line and use this line, you know? So single tracks are a little bit more, is more flexibility. And mm-hmm. you don't, you're not dragging a machine back into the woods to rebuild the trail. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's you know, done by hand or whatever but on big jump lines anything that's excavated you got to get it just right otherwise it just costs money to Mm. to fix right yeah yeah in both cases though it sounds like you're you definitely take your cues from the riders and like in the example of breaking bumps i mean the way you explained it kind of flips it in my head in the way that i would normally look at it which is i would blame the riders i would say Oh, there's breaking bumps here because there's a bunch of guys that don't know how to ride and they're, you know, breaking at the wrong point. But, but really it's, it 
a lot of times it's the design of the trail that you have to break because the corner is too sharp or it's too soon or it's unexpected or whatever. And so it sounds like you're, you're kind of reading the cues from the riders to help you inform the design of the trail. Is, is that right? Part of it, you nailed, you nailed it. Like the, you know, if you, if you have a feature where you got to break really hard, you're going to have brake bumps. Right. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't really come. I don't talk to a bunch of riders and and ask them how I should build the trail. (laughs) I already know, you know, how to build the trail when, when we're talking about building an A line style trail, Mm -hmm. what we try to avoid is, is anything where you land downhill and go into a corner. Mm -hmm. So, it jumps into a corner, for instance, bad news, because you need speed for the jump and then you need to break for the corner, right? Right. So would we, we use grade reversals and mm-hmm. making sure that our grades are such that, you know, at, at normal speed, you don't have to pedal because pedaling is dangerous on jump trails as well. Mm-hmm. And, and you have minimum braking. And if you have any braking, it's done when you go going, uphill in a great reversal therefore you don't mm. really drag in on the ground as much right because you know you're mm-hmm. you're going uphill and it's just really just gentle braking you're just kind of drag your brakes a bit but mm. yeah. you know having said that you're getting so many different varieties of riders now um on all the trails so not any trail is going to be perfect, you mm-hmm. know, for every rider. If I if I build a trail that's got, you know, 40 foot, 50 foot tables, well, it's not going to be very good for that intermediate guy that can ride uh, A-line at 25, 30 foot ta- tables. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But yeah. the expert guy can have a pretty good time on 25 30 foot tables but you know Mm. he'd probably want to ride some bigger so therefore what you need is a variety of trails we you know we got a line dirt merchant right crab apple hits so that's what you need you really need to have the variety of trails but you know not every bike park can accommodate that whistler's lucky right it's huge right yeah and what you said about the grade reversals and like the idea of breaking, you know, ahead of the jump and then also after the jump. I mean, I think for me that just kind of unlocked in my mind, like why Whistler is so special and and why I enjoy riding there so much is because you can just let go of your brakes and you're going to, you're going to clear the jump just right. And you're going to be set up for the next one uh, without really having to to think about your speed without having to say, Oh, should I break here? Should I let off the brakes? Yeah. It's almost like intuitive. Once you get that, did it take a long time to develop that sort of sense of how to design a trail to, to flow that way? Well, if we built a line now, instead of in 2000, we Mm -hmm. would probably do a few things different. But not mm. a lot, you know, like the general grade of the trail is good. We're, we're you know, we're missing the grade reversals in a few spots. Uh, and that's that's kind of the key. That's what we developed through our, you know, as we were building trails, we we're going, ah, we're still getting, we're still getting brake bumps here, you know, a little bit. We mm-hmm. need to put in a bigger grade of reversal. And then we, you know, we start to play with innovation, like step ups going uphill and, into a corner and things like that. Right. So we definitely, you know, every time we build a trail, we learn, Mm. Uh, you know, I can't say that I've, I know everything about trail design. Definitely not. You know, every time we're building a trail and usually, you know, different environments, we're always learning. So it's, it's, uh, it's cool that way, but it's important to realize, you know, that if, if you're, you know, if I, if you have brake bumps, why is it I have brake bumps? Don't do that same, same, don't build the same feature again somewhere else. You know what I mean? So uh, <laughs> right. over the years, yeah. we kind of, we, we developed our, our technique and, and 
yeah, it's getting and it gets easier and easier as we go along to build trails now, less head scratching, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So when you're when you are designing a trail or let's say a feature, are there a lot of trade offs in terms of like making a feature safe but also fun? Like, is safety is safety something that you have to think about a lot, or do do the two kind of go hand in hand? Hand in hand, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Used to get kind of a lot of pushbacks. Oh, you know, you guys are filling in the gaps. I'm going, what do you need a gap for? You're going to fly over it anyways, <laughs> right? So what's what's your problem with it, right? And uh, yeah. definitely, you know, safety is is uh, paramount. I mean, now now we have a now we have a designation that's pro line, not mm-hmm. not named after me <laughs> i could tell you the story behind it if you want but anyways it it has no limitation you know mm. so you could have uh, gaps and and uh you know you could have drops without down ramps and so on and also also comes to the stage of the development of a bike park like if you're a Whistler, it's fully developed. It's got so many other options that you can you can take. You don't need to take this pro line trail, mm-hmm. right? And and it's you know they're all well signed and the warnings are there. You can go and you know hit some other trail that doesn't have these committing features. Mm-hmm. But you go to a bike park that's not as developed, and uh, you know you don't have you don't have these uh, options or so many of them, you know, it's really hard to put in something that's a pro line. Mm -hmm. And uh, now you're, you know, eating up terrain where you could have a a trail that is more inclusive, but, you know, Mm -hmm. you're going to put in a pro line and, and you, you know, fraction of the people that, that visit your bike park and, can ride it is that a good decision no whistler really stands apart like you said because it is such a big park and it's it's developed out and you know i remember seeing the map a couple years ago where they have all the trails listed in order of difficulty right where you start with like the greenest of the green trails and then you go i imagine all the way to those pro line trails and i mean to ride all of those in that order right if you were like someone who's just starting out or it's your first time at a bike park. I mean, it would take weeks, I would imagine. Um, and by the time you got to that pro line, you know, maybe, maybe you'd be almost ready for it. Um, but yeah, like you said, you have to have all those options. So you're not kind of jumping ahead and, and getting into something that's unsafe. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, like I said before, uh, when we just had a line, we, we got a lot of people on a line that, you know, did not uh, have the ability to ride the trail and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, it caused trouble. And, uh, that's why we build crank it up. Mm. So if you, you build some kind of a pro line somewhere in a bike park and you don't have any lesser options, people will do it. Right. (laughs) They'll, they'll do it, you know, and uh, I, do I want to be responsible for, you know, someone getting wrecked on my trip. No, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's a tough decision, but not really, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like we, when we build bike parks and, uh, and they say, Oh, we need gaps and we need this. I'm going, yeah, well, you don't need gaps, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of challenging trails, you know, it seems like most bike park visitors prefer the like flowy, jumpy trails to some of the more like raw and technical lines. So why do you think so many mountain bikers like to complain about the flow trails if if most of us end up uh, riding those more anyway? We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night, ember hot an icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end... What will I become? Senwa Saga. Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. (laughs) 
Yeah, well, so, you know, who's, who's the vocal majority, right? Is, you know, the, the, you know, expert riders, wannabe expert riders. I would say, you know, that's the problem. Like the, mm. the, the person that's a beginner or just new to the sport, are they on pink bikes spouting off about, you know, <laughs> uh, flow trails? No, they're not, you no. know, so. But they're listening, they're reading the comments and they're getting, yeah, yeah. they're getting this in their head that like flow trails are not good and I need to be on these, these technical trails. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm not, I'm not sort of, uh, poo-pooing the, the subject, but if you have a bike park that, you know, you're not building variety, mm -hmm. you know, you've built, let's say you built a few trails, you built, you know, you've got your green trail, you've got a jump line, you've got a blue jump line, you've got blue flow trail, and then you got two or three single tracks, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, next year you go, oh, we need another, you know, excavated uh, or a hybrid trail. So you build that. Then you go, oh, we'll need another mm -hmm. flow trail. Well, you know, the people that like the raw single tracks, they're going to they're gonna say something, mm -hmm. right? So I would say it's not that we're building too many flow trails. I think that we're just not building variety. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny because at my last visit to to Whistler Bike Park, you know, I'm not I'm not someone who does a lot of jumping. I don't have that terrain near me, and so I don't I don't get to do it a lot, and I'm not not great at it. But I have no problem riding technical trails, and so yeah, seeking out the ones at Whistler Bike Park. There's some great technical descents, and you won't see anybody on those trails a lot of days. And to me, though, they they feel safer. In that you're you're definitely like slower speed and you're you have a lot more control. But yeah, I don't I don't know if everybody everybody sees it that way. I totally agree with you. The injuries are produced on trails that see high volume and high speed hmm. and air. Hmm. You know, that's yeah. I mean A line, I don't know. I don't know the amount of visits I think that thing sees it's in the millions, you know million mm. rides per year for sure yeah um when you think about they have two hundred thousand visits and if you say that everybody that visits rides uh a line at least five times there you go you got a million people which means there's way more well you know yeah you got high speed you got big air then you then you go you know you add in maybe a lack of skill because some people are experimenting mm-hmm if you go down, you, you know, it might be collarbone or, you know, could be, could be more serious than if you fall over on Schleyer or Joyride or, mm -hmm. or, you know, you're just going to get a scrape and, and bump your elbow. Right. Yeah. Because it's slow speed. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. So what are some of the latest trends you're seeing in bike park design today? What are your clients asking you for, or what are the things that you're, you're kind of pushing them toward that they should be thinking about for the future? I mean, we always, you know, think about the business model because mm. if in the end the client isn't going to make any money, well, what's the point, right? Right. So it's still the tried and true you know, model, you got the green trail, you got, you know, blue flow trail, you got blue jump line, and you got blue, black, single track to start off mm -hmm. with. But we've been playing with, um, you know, with creativity of those trails. So in a, in a bike park in Sweden called Jarvso, uh and in Green Hill in Germany, they're very small. And the trails have to mm. crisscross. So we built, you know, mm -hmm. cool wooden features that go over top of each other. And, oh. and we've, we've been playing with spiral features, which is pretty cool. You can look it up in Green Hill in Germany. Mm. Um, they had, they had this old snow cap and, and the client says, oh, I want to put the snow cap somewhere. So we thought, oh, maybe we'll have a jump over the snow cap. But it wasn't really working out <laughs> with where, you know, the trail was going to finish. And and so we 
we made a spiral that spirals you up and around on top of the snowcat, and then you jump <laughs> off the top of the snowcat. It's like one of the coolest features. Yeah, <laughs> and you know that 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 feature also uh, exists on Banana Peel uh, in Trestle Bike Park. Hmm. And I just noticed Nico Vink actually building something somewhere where they have a same thing spiral. You know where you where you go and up and around 360 and then jump over the trail you came in on Whoa. and down. So, you know, things like that, um, just basically being innovative and, and, you know, this is nothing new, but shark fins and, mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of terminating or, or, or a corner with a gap in the middle of it, you know, small gap in the middle of it, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. It sounds like is some of this maybe being driven by like, you know, I mean, it's marketing, it's, it's the social media age, right? Where like every park wants to have some Instagrammable feature that's unique and iconic. And, you know, if you see a picture of somebody riding over this snow cat, like, you know, immediately where that is, is that, does that drive some of the decisions? Yes, for sure. From the client's side. I could care less about <laughs> social media, but they, right. but they care and I, I get it. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, in my, when I'm designing a trail and, um, this is not, uh, you know, flow jump or, or trails like that, but a single track, like for instance, top of the world, I look for, uh, vistas, you know, mm -hmm. points of interest and, uh, viewpoints and things like that, that I, not I'm not going to miss those, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll backtrack with my design if I if I'm going to miss one of these things, and I'll mm -hmm. make sure that it's included, you know. So yeah. we we do we pay attention to that kind of stuff. Instagram is not in my back of my head, but definitely I think more about the writer than Instagram. <laughs> right, that's good. Good to keep the writer at the front. Well, you've been involved in bike park builds all over the world. Do you have a favorite park or a trail that you like to ride? Yeah, I have a few. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, Let's Whistler, obviously, mm -hmm. right? My favorite uh, lap on Whistler is top of the world to ride on slide, which is a bit of a out-of-bound trail, but, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it's just, yeah, relentless. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that lap. And then you end up at Creekside. So yeah, Whistler's, you know, close, close to my heart, obviously, mm -hmm. but yeah. there's, you know, we've done, we've done some builds that I just, I just love. And, and, you know, not just even for the trails, but for the people that, that we're involved with, mm. you know, you got, uh, you know, Dave built Thunder, Thunder Mountain at Berkshire East, right? He's been working with those guys and, and, uh, you know, we're super proud of that, that, uh, bike park, um, Yarvso in Sweden that we've been working with for, uh, you know, over 10 years, mm -hmm. Green Hill, you know, super cool bike park and, and cool people. And, you know, they're, they just put their whole heart and soul into it. Really fun trails. Trestle working with Bob Holm and his crew there over 10 years. You know, I have a favorite trail there called Cruel and Unusual. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That's a good trail there. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, Snowmass, uh, also really, really cool team. People that, people that commit, you know, they commit to the project and they stay committed to the project. Mm -hmm. And then, then, you know, they make us look good because they're successful. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, and Sugarloaf uh, in New Brunswick in Canada that, you know, Greg Dion, we've been working with him. Just a small bike park, but, uh, you know, super committed and, and really fun place. Yeah, yeah, that's a great list. Well, Tom, yeah, it's been awesome to talk to you and to hear about your trail building process and, and the development of bike parks. And, yeah, we've learned a lot, so thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah, it's uh Great talking to you. Good questions. I really, really like your questions. Awesome. Thank you. Well, you can uh, find out more about some of the projects that Gravity Logic 
uh, has worked on over the years and, and find out more about their services online at whistlergravitylogic.com. And we'll have that link in the show notes. That's all we've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week.